So in Unit 3, we cover the cardiovascular system, and we're going to start with the heart. So just as a reference point on this model, this represents the diaphragm. So below this would be the abdominal cavity, and we're in the thoracic cavity. As a review of the last unit, remember on either side of the lungs, the heart, on either side of the heart, the lungs would set in their own pleural cavities. And the center part of the, of the thoracic cavity where the heart and all the major blood vessels uh, coming to and from the heart, as well as the trachea here and the esophagus posterior to that would all be found, are refer, is referred to as the mediastium. So as we're looking here in the uh, heart itself, then recall that the heart was part of the ventral body cavity. So it's going to be surrounded with uh, membranes that uh, separate the heart from the lungs, which would be the parietal membranes, and then membranes on the surface of the heart itself. And so what we would commonly call this is the pericardial cavity. So what we're seeing here is the parietal pericardium, and it's two-layered, so the inner layer here is the true parietal pericardium, the outer layer is called the fibrous pericardium. The fibrous pericardium, as we can see here, is going to have quite a bit of fat associated with it when we looked at an in individual and when we look at, when we do heart dissections, and it also attaches the, the pericardial cavity to the diaphragm to maintain its relic position. So there would be a space between the parietal pericardium and the heart itself, which would be the pericardial cavity. And then the surface of the heart would be covered with a membrane that we call the visceral pericardium. So as we look at this other model, then what we see is that down here there's a layer that's uh, associated with the surface of the heart, contains quite a bit of adipose tissue, and then it's been pulled away uh, superiorly here so you can see the blood vessels better. So this represents the visceral pericardium that would cover the outside of the heart. Now, when we look at the wall of the heart itself, and the outside of the heart is covered by the visceral pericardium, as we take this model apart, the heart itself is made up of specialized muscle fibers that we call cardiac muscle. So where the cardiac muscle is, exists, we call it the myocardium. And then the lining on the inside of the heart would be a single layer of squamous cells that's continuous throughout the heart into the blood vessels. So in the heart, we call it the endocardium. And in blood vessels, we call it the endothelium. So if we use the word endo to describe this, myo to describe that, then the other word we can use for the visceral pericardium would be the epicardium. And then we would have epicardium on the outside surface, myocardium on the inside surface, and endocardium on the innermost surface of the heart itself. As we look externally on the heart, and we can see it in this model, then the heart itself has two chambers that are superior to it, which are the atria, and so, and then two chambers uh, inferior to that that we say are the ventricles. And so, what we're looking at here is the right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle. Now, on the surface, there are little grooves where blood vessels set. And a groove is called a sulcus. So we have a groove that we can see on both the right and left sides of the heart. That's a groove between the atria of the heart and the ventricles of the heart. So this groove is called the coronary sulcus. And major blood vessels sit here. So on this particular model, uh, and on a real heart, we would actually see a lot of fat deposition in that coronary sulcus. So we can see the coronary sulcus here, and we can see the coronary sulcus here. Now we also have a sulcus where the major blood vessels of the anterior aspect of the heart run. And so this sulcus is, called, is on the anterior surface, so we refer to it as anterior. And it's actually also 
chip between the two ventricles, the right ventricle, which is over here, and the left ventricle, which is over here. So we refer, refer to it as the anterior interventricular uh, sulcus. And again, we have quite a bit of adipose tissue associated with that. If we turn the heart around, which we can see better on this model, then we would also have a groove where these blood vessels sit here. And it's on the back side of the heart, and it's also between the two ventricles. So the groove where this, these blood vessels would sit here would be the posterior interventricular sulcus of the heart itself. Now, when we're looking at the external anatomy of the heart, then there are major blood vessels that come to and away from the heart. So as we're looking at this model, the anteriormost blood vessel of the heart is the pulmonary trunk. And it's going to divide up here into left and right pulmonary arteries. And this blood vessel arises from the right ventricle. Just next to the pulmonary trunk is this large red blood vessel, which is the aorta. And we define the aorta as being the ascending aorta because blood is traveling upward in it. And then the aorta is going to cross across the top of the heart and curve downward. And so we call this the aortic arch, where it's curving over the top of the heart. And we have three main branches that arise off of the aortic arch. The brachiocephalic, the left common carotid, and the left subclavian in order. Now, blood is returned to the heart via veins. So when we're looking at the right side of the heart, then this large vein that's bringing blood back to the right side of the heart and actually dumping blood into the right atrium is the superior vena cava and it would drain all, all of your body above the level of the heart. Then if we look at the posterior aspect and inferior aspect of that passageway, then this would be the inferior vena cava that's bringing blood back to the heart from lower than the heart. So what brings all blood back into the right atrium uh, from the body itself is the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Now one will note that when you look at that the vena cavas are blue and the pulmonary trunk is blue. And so we oftentimes mistake red and blue as meaning artery and vein. And what red and blue really is, is a determination of oxygen content of blood. So that blue blood vessels are carrying ox oxygen poor blood and red blood vessels are carrying oxygen rich blood. So the way the heart works is the vena cavas bring oxygen poor blood back to the right side of the heart, to the right atrium, where it eventually goes to the right ventricle and then the right ventricle pumps the blood via the pulmonary trunk to the lungs where it's going to be oxygenated. So if we look at the posterior aspect of this heart, we're going to see some red blood vessels here. And then if we look at the other side, we're going to see red blood vessels there. Now these red blood vessels represent pulmonary veins. And again, they're bringing blood back from the lungs to the heart, and so they contain oxygenated blood. The pulmonary veins bring blood back to the left atrium, where the blood goes to the left ventricle, and then gets pumped via the aorta. So those are all the major blood vessels that come to the heart. Now, interestingly, this little structure here is called the ligamentum arteriosum, and it connects the pulmonary trunk to the aorta. During fetal development, the embryonic development, when you were attached to your placenta, the lungs were not where oxygen was coming from, but, but your placenta. So this was a structure that moved blood that would be pumped to the lungs later in your life into the aorta where it could go to the placenta to gain oxygen. So in a baby, it's called a ductus arteriosus, and it's designed to shunt blood away from the pulmonary system into the aorta. 
because the lungs aren't where your blood is being oxygenated at that point in your life. So as we look at the internal anatomy of the heart, we can see the chambers that we were just referring to. And so on this side we have the right atrium. On this side we have the left atrium. On this side we have the right ventricle. And on this side we have the left ventricle. Because the right ventricle only pumps blood to the lungs, its myocardium is fairly thin. Because the left ventricle pumps blood all over your body, its myocardium is fairly thick. Now, within the heart itself, we have valves that allow blood to flow from atria to ventricles. But when the ventricles contract, prohibit blood from passing backwards up into the atria. So these two valves are essentially one-way valves, which can be collectively called atrioventricular valves because they're between the atria and the ventricles. But they also have specific names. So on the right side, it's called the tricuspid valve and on the left side it's called the bicuspid valve and an old clinical name that you can still hear which is the mitral valve. Now to prevent these valves from being pushed upward during ventricular contraction by pressure then what attaches to the valves are these tendons that we call chordae tendinae and then the chordae tendinae attach to these elevated layers of muscle that we call papillary muscles. So we have a papillary muscle and chordae tendinae. We see that pattern throughout this. So when the myocardium contracts, these papillary muscles contract, increase their tension on the chordae tendinae, which prevents this valve from being pushed open backward. And from a clinical standpoint, if this valve or this valve uh, bleeds blood back through it, then we would have a heart murmur. And then we would listen to which side of the uh, heart has that heart murmur. So when these are devoid of blood, then they kind of collapse on themselves. And because they collapse on themselves, then we get this kind of ear-like structure that we see here on the right side and on the left side. So it's called an oracle. So here would be the left oracle, and here would be the right oracle. 